Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into the origins and evolutions of American government. The, ed- the executive director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also the host of this discussion. And here he is, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Agnes, and welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and civic responsibility as we are at the very first day of a new month. Today is the first day of February in the year 2016. It is a pleasure to be with you at the start of a new week uh, as we move uh, through what so far has been a very, very manageable winter weather-wise. And um, uh, I hope that uh, it has been. I know there's been some wild weather around, but uh, obviously I I I go by what I look out the window when I go and walk the dog. I kind of draw my conclusions based on on what kind of conditions I'm walking in. But uh, be that as it may, it is a pleasure to be with you here at the start of a new week. Just before we came on the air, I was doing a little bit of reflecting about the fact that today is the 1st of February. And I was thinking that we began these programs here at the Virtual Center I believe if you look at the archives at whiterosesociety.org, you will note that the very first date, the first broadcast for the Virtual Center is, I believe, March 11th in the year 2013. So what that means is that we have uh, entered our uh, our 35th month of broadcasting uh, here at the Virtual Center. Um, As of the 11th of March, uh, which is about uh, 37, 38 days from now, we will be completing our third year of broadcasting. And uh, it is just unbelievable to me that that you all have been uh, so patient uh, with me uh, and that I've been able to come up with what I hope are meaningful programs. I know that many of you have have stuck with us through thick and thin here, so I have to anticipate from that that there's something here uh, that you feel is worth is worth your time uh, and and the the effort and the consistency of your sticking with us. So I appreciate that so much and I want you to know that. Um, as we enter a new week uh, uh, here at the virtual center, Uh, I want to begin, as we always do, by inviting you to participate actively in our program. Uh, We do have a phone number. Uh, Agnes is in the studios, and when you call, you will, uh, I'm sure, be speaking with her, and she will get you on the air. Our phone number is area code 304-663-4676. That's 304-663-4676. 4676. 4676, of course, translates on your keypad to horn, H-O-R-N. Um, my email address, if you'd like to communicate directly with me one-on-one via email, and I can understand that because there are a lot of folks out there that would be a little bit reluctant to go on the air and share their thoughts with the world, so to speak. Um, I don't want you to hesitate to do that. But I do understand uh, that there are a number of folks who wouldn't do that. I know, uh, you know, for a long, long time in the early portion of my life, that's the last thing I would have done. Uh, So email would have been, for me, uh, you know, a way to get my thoughts down on paper and extend extend my thoughts to someone else without without risking uh, uh, making a mistake or sounding foolish or or whatever. Um, You won't, I promise you. Um, But if you would like to send me an email, uh, let me give you my email address. Uh, It is waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien, O-B-R-I-E-N, 906 at gmail.com. And finally, I would like to make you aware of our Facebook page. We have had that page up now for... for, uh, going on, I guess, probably four or five months now. Um, If you go to Facebook, if you are a regular user of Facebook, uh, and you do go to Facebook, just type in the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution, 
and you will have access to our Facebook page. I have tried to dutifully uh, not let too much time go by before posting uh, something which I believe uh, should be, ought to be of interest, at least to some folks, on our Facebook page. This past weekend, in fact, yesterday, I posted uh, uh, two items, uh, both of which I'd like to uh, to deal with uh, today, uh, as as part of the substantive basis of our of our program today. But I do invite you to comment and to feel free to share your thoughts about what's on the Facebook page. Um, you know, m much of it, obviously, I, I wrote most of it. I, I tend to be the one putting it on there. Um, and many of these things are rather are kind of opinion pieces that I've put together, much of it based on uh, issues and uh, uh, content that we have dealt with or addressed here at the Virtual Center in one way or another. Uh, and one of the things that I have taken to do, and those of you who do look at the Facebook page on a regular basis will recognize that indeed I do that. I try to, if it occurs to me, I try to think about putting something on Facebook in order to encourage people to tune in to our pr programs here at the Virtual Center. If I know ahead of time what the program the next day is going to be about, uh, I will oftentimes put uh, something on Facebook which gives folks an idea as to what the topic of the day, if there is indeed just one, sometimes there are more than one, we understand. Um, but if I do know the topic of the day, a, a major part of what our program will be about, I try to uh, put that on Facebook so that uh, people who are interested in it might be inclined to, to tune in. I do believe that we have expanded our listenership uh, here at the Virtual Center somewhat with the Facebook page. Uh, I will ag acknowledge and admit um, that it's a time consumer keeping up with the, the Facebook page and putting things on it. On the other hand, there's a good side to that, and that, that is that it keeps me writing and keeps me thinking and keeps me active, uh, and I do appreciate that so much. Uh, that in combination with the uh, time we spend together here at the Virtual Center, uh, very honestly, keeps me pretty busy, and, uh, and I do appreciate it. So again, we would love to hear from you. If you recall, last Wednesday when we were last together live, uh, Bob Kincaid joined us, uh, as did Horst from Taiwan, and we spent quite a bit of time, um, if you recall, uh, in one, what I thought was one of the most exhilarating discussions I've had. Seems like when those guys uh, get involved, uh, it usually is. I know that I, I, a couple of people that I talked to who listened to that program uh, commented very favorably upon it, how much uh, those two add to the program. I understand that. I recognize that. And that's why I each day uh, try to take a moment at the beginning to solicit uh, your input and your inclination, if it's there, uh, to pick up the phone and give us a call and get on the air and share your thoughts. Uh, the interaction, very honestly, um, it, it not only provides much, uh, much more interesting conversation, but it usually produces something meaningful as a result of that conversation. Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, a good a good dialogue, a good back and forth on a particular topic, uh, can usually end up in both sides uh, leaving the conversation knowing more than they did when they came in, and that's really what the whole purpose of it is. So, if you are inclined to to share your thoughts or your ideas. Uh, I do appreciate it very well. I did receive an, uh, an email, uh, a link actually, from one of our listeners uh, on charter schools. Uh, and I, you know, I was quite interested in that uh, because um, charter schools are one of those uh, reforms in our K-12 education system that seem to be taking off. And again, there's a lot of controversy about charter schools, positive and negative as well. Conceptually, the concept of charter schools is is so great because, you know, they are public schools, um, which means that since they are public schools, that means that everybody potentially has access to them. Um, the fact of the matter is if they specialize, as most charter schools do, in particular subject areas, whether it be science, math, and engineering, uh, whether it be the arts, whatever it might be, uh, that's obviously going to dissuade some people just by the by the mere fact that the particular charter school 
uh, features a, a particular topic. But this particular link that our listener Gene sent uh, to me, which I thought was interesting, is that um, the, the, the general uh, theme of the, of the piece, of the link, was that charter schools are here to stay. Uh, to stay. And what that means is that uh, no longer, this is the basic uh, gist of the discussion, no longer are people um, raising questions about whether, in fact, uh, school choice is something that will last or is a fad. The basic premise here is that that school choice is something that parents are not going to give up easily. Uh, it's with us. Uh, the real the real questions then are how, why, when, where, what, you know, those kinds of things. But whether, in fact, there's going to be more and more school choice as we go on in the form of charter schools seems to be um, a closed book, so to speak, as more and more states move into the move into the charter school movement. Of course, the fact of the matter is we now know because charter schools have been in effect now for since the 90s. I believe uh, the state of Minnesota was the first uh, official charter school, and that was in the early 90s. But the fact of the matter is a number of states have offered them, but now that they've been in business for as long as they have, we have uh, we are able to go back and look at some of the results, and all the results are not positive, very interesting, you know, very, uh, very realistically. Um, some of the results are positive, some of them are not. Uh, but conceptually, I think the idea of a charter school is, is an excellent one. The fact of the matter is, however, that uh, um, although charter schools, at least on the surface, are not uh, uh, selective in who they admit and who they don't, uh, the fact of the matter is the, the particular emphasis of the charter school, by definition, seems to uh, seems to me to contain an element of um, of of distinctiveness, uh, which tends to dissuade many people from uh, uh, going into it. But the basic premise of the idea that the charter school is something um, that that the state funds, but at the same time uh, releases from many of the restrictions and bureaucratic regulations that uh, in many cases st strangle or near st nearly strangle our, our public schools, at, at, you know, our, our public schools as a, as a whole, uh, charter schools are able to escape um, a lot of those regulations. Uh, but in effect, um, as a you know, as a uh, as a counter to that, charter schools acknowledge or admit or express their willingness to be held accountable for the way they educate the st their students. Uh, in other words, that's the exchange. In a in a exchange for freedom from bureaucratic red tape, charter schools promise to be accountable in terms of student performance. And the fact of the matter is, as we have now twenty. 20, 20, close to 25 years of, of history uh, to look back on our charter schools, we recognize that some of the student performance in charter schools has not, has not been all that it's uh, talked up to be. We, we understand that. But anyway, the point was it was a very, very interesting link, and, and I wanted to, to, uh, to uh, take time on the air to thank Gene for it. I think it's very, very informative, and it's a very, very interesting uh, topic. Fact of the matter is, um, I think that the bulk of our program today is going to be focusing on uh, education. Of course, we've we've spent over the last several years, two, three, two or three years of broadcasts here at the Virtual Center, we've devoted a number of these programs to education, some of it in higher education, some of it uh, focusing on K through 12. And the reason, obviously, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this many times before, I don't think we need to take a lot of time here. But there's absolutely no question that most people believe that, that our system of public education, how we educate our young people, really goes a long way in determining how effective we are in meeting not only the goals, but the potential of this republic. People's opportunity to get ahead, it seems to me, is tied directly to the success of our educational systems. Because for most people, education, at least traditionally, 
has been the way that generation by generation people tend to move ahead and up. Uh, I was uh, I was struck this weekend by I was thinking of the term the American dream in in the course of you know in the sense of what I was just talking about about our education system and I ran across a quote this a quotation this week which which I'm I'm sure many of you have have seen before I hadn't. Uh, it was a statement by the comedian who passed away a few years ago, George Carlin. And he was talking about the idea of the American dream. And he pointed out the reason they call it an Amer- the American dream is because people need to be asleep in order to, to, to see it and recognize it and appreciate it. Uh, the implication is that in real life it doesn't really work. Fact of the matter is one of the real challenges that we face in this nation is indeed exactly that, that in the last several years, as a, as a result of the inequality and many of the things that have seemingly engulfed our society, our economy, our way of life, the fact of the matter is our public education system seems not to be performing at the levels that many believe it once did. And of course, you can qualify all of those conclusions. For example, the fact of the matter is we are educating more of our young people than we ever did before in our public education system. So consequently, that has costs. And, you know, by, by admitting everybody, by having to serve everybody, by making accommodations for special needs students and all the rest of it, and all the rest of those accommodations which have, which have occurred and come up over the years, our public education system has focused on serving everybody, but the fact of the matter is, in terms of overall performance and, count and accountability, that fact has costs. The more limited, the more selective your student population is, the better the performance that, that the schools can demonstrate. I think that, that makes perfect sense, and that's part of the, uh, it seems to me, what drives the uh, the enthusiasm about charter schools, very honestly. Um, but anyway, our topic today is going to be a little bit about education, but um, this one is going to be focused more on higher education, um, that and a, and a number of other things. It's, it's going to be quite, quite new. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, today's topics and, and the issues by by sharing with you a couple of things that were on Facebook. Um, last, late yesterday, last early, early yesterday evening, I think, it would be late in the afternoon, early in the evening, I can't remember the exact time. But I posted um, a notice on Facebook that after spending um, a lot of time, and I mean this, um, this, I've been, uh, uh, chewing on this particular decision for uh, for several for several days, in fact, for more than a couple of weeks. Um, and as we move through the month of January, um, I began to focus and concentrate on it more and chew harder, if that makes sense. Um, I decided, and I know I put on Facebook last night, that I have decided to make myself available for the legislature here in West Virginia, the House of Delegates. Um, it's a decision that, uh, that I don't take lightly. Um, however, it's something that I believe I can make a contribution to. It's something I would like to try. I'll be very honest with you, it's something that off and on over the years I have frequently thought that I would like to try. Um, all the years that, uh, that I, in the 25 years that I've spent in West Virginia here affiliated with Concord University um, and, and in the process of teaching uh, college level American history and American government, I played with the idea off and on of running for political office. But the fact of the matter is, as an employee of a public higher education institution in this state, I could not uh, stand for office. It would be uh, uh, 
it would raise all sorts of conflict of interest questions. Uh, I did, at, in fact, a few several years ago, I did indeed approach the subject with the president of Concord uh, and told him I was thinking about this, and he encouraged me to uh, to not to to not do that. Uh, he said basically his point is that it's going to create an issue. Some people are going to ra raise conflict of interest questions. It's going to put the institution. Uh, under the microscope and potentially put it in a bad light. And uh, it just raises more issues uh, than it seemed uh, to be worth raising. So I kind of pushed the idea away and forgot about it for several years after that. But now that I'm retired and now that I'm not teaching for the first year and a half that I, that I was officially retired, I continue to teach adjunct part-time classes. Uh, but for the last year now, I've not been doing that. And the more I thought about it, the more I, I really believe that this might be the time. Uh, if it's not, then it won't come because I'm reach, I've reached the point in my, in my life where some of these things, if I'm going to do them, I've got to do them now. Um, so with that and, and talking it over very seriously, very carefully with my wife, because this is going to be, uh, an imposition on her as as well. Uh, I did decide to uh, to give it a try, and so I sent in the papers because they were due. The filing papers had to be in by the end of January, so I sent the papers in. And about a week ago, I think it was last Tuesday, I got a call from the West Virginia Secretary of State's office, letting me know that the that the the Secretary of State's office was in the process of filing my paperwork and making sure that my name appeared on the on the ballot. So I will be a candidate in the primaries, and the primary election here in West Virginia is on May 10th, and the, uh, the regular election in the fall, of course, is uh, the first Tuesday in November, which is exactly the time uh, that the uh, presidential election will be, will be contested as well. So whether, in fact, I'll get through the primaries and make it into the uh, election, uh, the, the mainstream election itself, uh, remains to be seen. But I'm going to give it a try, and I kind of wanted all of you to know that because, very honestly, much of, of the feedback and the information that I've gotten over the months uh, here at the Virtual Center is one of the things that prompts me to do this. And so I figured that the first place that I ought to announce it was on Facebook, so I did that last evening. And if you'd be interested, I, I have the piece that I posted on Facebook, and I, I think it, it, it pretty well says a lot about me and a little bit about why I have chosen to run, especially here uh, in West Virginia. Um, I identified myself as a lifelong Democrat committed to the principles that made that party great and worthy of the people's support. I've watched in frustration and disbelief as some have chosen to abandon those principles in search of personal and political advantage. I am running to restore trust in those principles. I really believe in the progressive principles of the Democratic Party. Um, I have been dismayed because I have seen more and more Democrats not only not embrace those principles, but actually, in, in some cases, stand opposed to them. Here in West Virginia, and I've been a, in West Virginia now for about a quarter of a century for 25 years, and for all the time up until the last year, the Democratic Party has controlled politics here in West Virginia, has controlled the, both the legislature and the governor's office, with a few exceptions. Governor Underwood was a Republican in the 90s and um, very, 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 very nice man. He, he passed away, and uh, I, indeed, I indeed did like him uh, personally. I was a little bit uncomfortable with some of the policies of the party he, he headed, but at the same time, it did not dissuade me from a genuine respect for the man and for his love of the state, his desire to do what he thought 
was the right thing. So many of the distinct, many of the things that that separated his positions and mine were were indeed disagreements, uh, things that we can debate and argue about. That's what the that's what our system is about. So I, I really had never had a problem with that. But for the most part, the Democratic Party, as such, controlled politics in the state. But the fact of the matter is, it wasn't too many years after coming here that I began to realize that in many ways, the Democratic Party here in West Virginia was much closer in many ways and many of its positions to to the Republican Party as I've seen it in other places. And the fact of the matter is, I was beginning to recognize, and in fact it disturbed me some, is that those that I would consider real progressive Democrats were kind of in short supply here. We had a vibrant labor movement. We had a a vibrant union movement here. West Virginia has a very, very strong and creditable labor history. Um, In fact, public broadcasting has been running. Uh, Last week ran a, a... uh, feature on the mine wars, uh, which were uh, an incredible chapter in West Virginia's history. But the fact of the matter is, it was becoming more and more clear to me that the label Democrat in this particular state didn't seem to have the same meaning that it did in other states in which I've lived and worked. And that kind of bothered me a little bit. The fact of the matter is, with the conservative movement at the state level that has taken place, we'll be doing some of this in in, in upcoming programs. Um, But as you know, many state legislatures and many governorships have moved, have gone uh, into uh, to the control of the Republican Party. Here in West Virginia last year, and I, I've mentioned this, I've told this story before, we had a situation where while the Republicans clearly won control of the House of Representatives, the House of Delegates here, the Senate ended up to be a flat out tie last year until one of the candidates elected as a Democrat, just as the, as the legislative session opened last year, last January, switched parties and became a Republican. Of course, the reality is he had switched parties before. Um, He was, uh, he seemed to feel very comfortable moving back and forth from one party to the other uh, over the years. But that's that's neither here nor there. That's more personal uh, than it is philosophical, and I don't want to go there. But the fact of the matter is the Republican control of the West Virginia Senate, because of that party switch, was 18 to 16. And as a result, the Republican Party was able to move much of, not all of, but much of its most desirable legislation through the West Virginia legislature. And as this particular year's session opened, that same individual became news again because he resigned his seat as a Republican member of the West Virginia Senate in order to take position in the private sector. And that threw the issue onto the desk of the governor as to whether the governor would appoint a Republican to replace him or a Democrat to replace him. The state attorney general, who happens to be a Republican, uh, came out very quickly and made the case that his opinion, his legal opinion was that the governor, who is a Democrat, would have to appoint a Republican because the person who vacated the seat was technically a Republican. He had switched from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. The case went to the West Virginia Supreme Court, and the court ruled that indeed the governor did, under the state constitution, need to follow through and appoint a replacement 
for the senator with yet another Republican, and the governor did that last week. So the, same, so the Republican-controlled West Virginia Senate has the same majority that it did last year. And already in the first couple of days of the session, right-to-work legislation has passed. The state's prevailing wage legislation um, is seemingly uh, under the knife and, and is about to be, to be terminated. Um, West Virginia also has a very, very unique uh, veto uh, requirement. The governor does have the veto power in West Virginia, but unlike most states where legislatures have the authority to override the governor's veto with a two-thirds vote, here in West Virginia, this legislature has the power to override a governor's veto by a majority vote. So what that means is the very same majority, however slight, that passed the legislation initially has the power to override the governor's veto without picking up one additional vote. So, the, so even though the governor threatens to veto certain pieces of legislation coming from the Republican-controlled legislature that, he, that he's opposed to, here in West Virginia, the legislature's ability to override the governor's veto is almost automatic. What that means is the veto power here in West Virginia is a bit absurd. It's meaningless, or seems to be meaningless. There's one more st part of the story that I wanted to share with you, and this goes back to last year when the senator in question announced in the media that he was changing parties from Democrat to Republican. And the, the, media, the, 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 the media raised the question with him, when the people in your district voted for you, they voted for you as a Democrat. Do you feel comfortable in violating that particular trust that the voters placed in you? By, they elected you as a Democrat, and now you're switching to be a Republican. And his response to that, and this was a year ago, and I've forgotten, I've not forgotten it, because it's, it's really kind of eaten at me. His response was, here in West Virginia, there really isn't any difference between Democrats and Republicans. And the reason that that kind of stuck with me was because that's what I had concluded. That, you know, in my years here, that here in West Virginia, Democrats were more like Republicans than they were Democrats, at least the kind of progressive Democrats that I was used to and that I subscribed to. The result is that as we are witnessing the debates in the media over particular pieces of legislation, The debates between the two parties here in West Virginia really lack what I think is substantive meaning because the fact of the matter is the parties are so much the same. The Democratic Party controlled West Virginia politics for close to a century. This is where it gets controversial. The fact of the matter is, most people who study West Virginia's history and politics would conclude that here in West Virginia over the last century, power was not located in the legislature, power was located in the private sector, principally in coal. So the fact of the matter is, even though the Democratic Party controlled the West Virginia legislature throughout this period, the fact of the matter is the legislature received significant portion of its marching orders from the private sector, from coal. In the little bit, and, and it's not a whole lot, but in some of the studying, studying that I've done of West Virginia history, it became very clear to me for over the years that the West Virginia, that West Virginia coal pretty much dictated what happened in the legislature and what didn't. 
And the fact of the matter is it didn't really make any difference which party was in control of the legislature because the party was not calling the shots anyway. The reason I make that particular point is because that's the argument that the Republican Party is currently making when its legislative priorities are challenged by the Democratic minority. As Democratic leaders challenge the particular direction that legislation seems to be going in here in West Virginia under Republican leadership, the Republican response is, look what's happened to West Virginia over the last hundred years when the Democratic control. How can we be any worse than when it was under Democratic control? The fact of the matter is, whether it was under Democratic control or under Republican control here in West Virginia really didn't make a difference. Because the senator who changed parties was right. Here in West Virginia, there's not that all that much difference between Democrats and Republicans. Why do I tell this story? Because my decision to run for the legislature as a Democrat demands that I make the case for progressive democratic politics. I believe that the Democratic Party here in West Virginia has abandoned the principles which made this party great. I believe that there is strong sentiment amongst the people of West Virginia for many of those principles. To be very honest with you, many of those principles are visible in the current presidential race in the Democratic Party in the person of Bernie Sanders. But more and more people are raising the questions, will the voters of this country vote for a democratic socialist or a social democrat or whatever you want to call it? The fact of the matter is many of the positions that Bernie Sanders is taking are traditional progressive positions that the Democratic Party grew on, became popular on, and attracted followers because of. And those are positions that I want to emphasize. Because if there is a constituency out there of the same mind that I am, which is in the current split in West Virginia between Democrats and Republicans, the differences tend to be too small, too meaningless. I would like to put out there a democratic agenda which does indeed offer a choice, which does indeed propose to make a difference. And this takes me back to the announcement. I believe that people matter more than money, power, or personal privilege. I believe that what's right is more important than what's profitable. The human dignity and a willingness to help others when they need it most matters more than any legislature legis sheet or any bottom line. I'm running because working people have a right to respect, a right to be paired, paid fairly and equitably, a right to a standard of living worthy of pride and respect. I believe, and I've talked to a lot of friends, and one of my closest friends who's called in many times here on the Head On Radio Network is, uh, is our friend Wayne. And Wayne just recently retired as a labor executive here, as, you know, as, a, as a, an officer uh, leader in the southern part of the state in worker-focused politics. Wayne and I have become good friends, and we agree that people who work full time in this day and age ought not to be receiving food stamps or needing welfare of some kind in order to make it. 
we believe, I believe, in the $15 per hour minimum wage. I believe that people who work full time ought to be able to live on that, on what they make in dignity. They ought need to go with hat in hand or the handout because they need more. I believe that companies who pay their employees too little to the point that they're that they remain eligible for public assistance, that their children remain eligible for public assistance, that many people working for a living qualify for Medicaid. Seems to me in this day and age to be wrong. The reason I say this, because here in West Virginia, every candidate, irrespective of party, talks about the need in West Virginia for jobs. There's no question we need jobs. I've talked to a number of good friends here who are in fields and professions like real estate, for example, who have told me, I have a number of clients from out of states who would like to come to West Virginia but they won't come here unless West Virginia becomes a right to work state, unless unions become part of West Virginia's past rather than a significant part of its present or its future. It seems to me that if there is a state in the union where unions have been necessary and meaningful, it's here in West Virginia. I believe, I believe very firmly in what the Pope said last June in his encyclical. And that is that there is a dignity associated with work. There's much more associated with work than the, month, than the salary you make. There's a sense of worth. The need to be able to make meaningful contributions to your community, to your neighborhood. People need to be able, need to believe that they are important and that they have something to contribute to the welfare and standard of living, not only of themselves and their own families, but of the people around them. And if these people work for a living, then their salary ought to be enough to enable them to do that. That's part of the dignity that traditionally is associated with a job. And the fact of the matter is, as I said at the end of my announcement, if there are employers out there who are eager to come to West Virginia so that they can exploit the availability of unemployed people here, more than half the people in West Virginia of working age are not working. We need jobs, but we don't need those kind of jobs. We don't need to be exploited any more than West Virginians have been exploited in the past. Yes, we want jobs, but we want jobs that come here with respect and dignity. We want people to come here and bring jobs here because this is where the most qualified, highly skilled, most motivated workers live. I apologize for the phone, but uh, uh, I'm in my study and I have another phone. So, um, so anyway, that's my that's going to be my position. That's what I'm running on. And I want to take a number of you know, I want to take a number of positions on issues. One of those issues is education. Um, because of my background, if I have anything to contribute in an area or in a specific area associated with economic development and the best quality of life of, of citizens, it's in education. And so I'm hoping that I am able, if I do get elected, 
to influence people to begin to look seriously at the quality of education and training that our people receive. We have got to begin, it seems to me, if we are going to turn this state around, we have got to begin to do it through our education system. And I don't mean necessarily K through, I mean our total education system. No longer can we, can we expect or no longer can we sustain or put up with a significant element of our population, of our school age population dropping out of school. No longer can we put up with a younger generation who have become victimized by what we call generational poverty whose number one goal in life is to, quote, get on the system, unquote, find a way to get some sort of public assistance so you don't have to work because there's no real good jobs here anyway, people conclude. We've got to break through and turn that around. And I think that I might have some ideas and some suggestions that might begin to move that process forward. So with that, I, I want to move more directly into, the, into these kinds of ideas, into these suggestions, and move away from the political aspects of it. But I do invite your calls and your emails, and, and uh, I really do appreciate uh, the input that I received here from, that I receive here on a regular basis from people who follow this program and who support this program. So I would love to hear from you. I would love to receive your best wishes. I am quite prepared to receive um, wishes other than your best wishes, if indeed um, uh, those are, are the ones that make you comfortable. I am open. I solicit your input. I respect the points of view and the intelligence of the people who listen to this program. And I look forward to hearing from you. And I appreciate your input and your willingness to, uh, to offer your suggestions and your thoughts on this, particular, on this particular matter. For years, while I was working and, and, and directing an off-campus center for Concord University here in southern, southern West Virginia, I was disturbed, increasingly disturbed, because so many of the people in this region who needed education the most were not being served. Not only not being served by Concord, but not being served by any of the other institutions of higher education in West Virginia either. About 10 years ago, actually not, about nine years ago actually, a community college housed here locally came into existence, New River Community College. And I became very encouraged because I've had, as many of you know, I've had su substantial community college experience. For 11 years, I worked full time in a community college in Virginia. Even after I left my job at the community college, I continued to teach part time evening classes for that same community college. So the fact of the matter is, through most of the 15 years that I was in Virginia, I was directly connected with the community college system. I believe in community college education. I do believe that society has needs which the community college are much more appropriate in addressing. And I became very encouraged with the emergence of New River Community College here in this region, because I believe that, that that institution would begin to serve students 
that the four-year institutions who were most concerned, understandably so, this is not a criticism, who were required to be concerned about standards, about their accreditation, about the accreditation of their particular programs, about the scholarship and financial aid money that, the, that these institutions were awarding. Excuse me. So the fact that so many citizens were not being served by our, our higher education institutions here in West Virginia is not totally a negative on them. Many of them have no choice. As I've mentioned before, here in southern West Virginia, we are on the cusp of a new day in higher education because the state's land-grant university, West Virginia University, has made the decision to move a campus to the southern West Virginia area. And many of the community leaders, political leaders, and business leaders in this region see a new day coming for this part of the state because West Virginia University is moving into the region. I, too, am elated and excited about that. But I have a caution. And my caution is that West Virginia University is an accredited, high standard university with programs all the way up to the graduate level. It has a hospital. It educates doctors. No way can West Virginia University jeopardize its accreditation in those world-renowned programs by serving the neediest people in this part of, the, of, of West Virginia for the basic kinds of skills they need. Consequently, while I am excited and, and positive about West Virginia's move into this part of the state, I find myself being required to pause because one more high quality institution of higher education here is not going to address the real issues. We've got too many uneducated and undereducated people in this part of the state. It's that simple. And with what's happening to coal and what's happening to this economy generally, many of the people with the best jobs are losing those jobs. And these people need retraining. And they are threatening to leave the state and move to other states in pursuit of work. We are on the edge of some major decisions here in West Virginia. And it is in recognition of those that over the years I began to to think about a way to serve the unserved. And I've been blessed, and I mean this sincerely, in that through it, during my years at Concord, I met others that I worked with, colleagues, who had the same concerns and the same priorities that I do. Since I've retired, one of my closest colleagues and friends has retired as well. He didn't record, I've been retired about three years. He retired about a year ago. He is a former vice president and academic dean. He has served in higher education administrations at some of the most reputable institutions in the country including Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Indiana University of Pennsylvania,
And of course, the last 10 to 12 years, Concord University here in southern West Virginia. A third colleague who is still working has joined us. And we have been meeting now off and on for several months. And the product of those meetings is a proposal. I am responsible for the proposal. I wrote the proposal, but it's with the input of these folks. And constantly I'm sending draft copies for input from them. And these, this proposal continues to change as more as they make more and more input. This proposal reflects our thinking, which reflects our conversation over the better part of the last six or seven years, as all of us were concerned about the inability of the existing institutions for higher, of higher education in this region to meet the needs of the community, to meet the needs of the region. The fact of the matter is the vast majority of West Virginia citizens are not being served by higher education. For the most part, higher education in West Virginia has been a ticket out of the state for some of the best and brightest over the years. That's not necessarily true for West Virginia University because it is the state university. But many of the smaller colleges, like Concord, like Bluefield State, like West Virginia Institute of Technology, which, is, which uh, features one of the best engineering programs in the country, these institutions over the years have attracted some of the brightest people, citizens of West Virginia. But upon receiving their degrees, these people tend to leave because the economy in West Virginia has not been diversified. It has not been exciting. It has not been open. It has not been thriving. It has been dominated by the extractive industries of coal and timber and most recently gas, natural gas. Research tells us that over the entire earth, those nations that are the richest in natural resources tend to be nations that put the least amount of money and resources into the education and development of their own people. If a region or a nation is blessed with natural resources, then the economies of those regions or nations tend to, tends to be driven by the extraction of those resources and the exploitation of those resources. What that means is most of the jobs in those areas have been jobs focusing on the extraction of wealth, the extraction of natural resources. Education levels in these areas have tended to suffer because governments have not needed to put resources into the education and development of their own people so long as the economy could be driven by the extraction of wealth. In those countries, in those nations of the world that are not blessed with natural resources, that must import the resources they need, those are the nations that tend to put the bulk of their resources into the education of their own people. Because their greatest resource is not what is under the earth. Their greatest resource 
is in the people who live within that particular region or that particular nation. So that's where those nations tend to put their wealth and their efforts. West Virginia is a classic example, a classic case study of that fact. West Virginia, at least the southern part of West Virginia, which encompasses the so-called coal fields, for close to, if not better than, a century, has focused principally on the extraction of coal and the exploitation of coal. <laughs> the jobs have been well-paying. The work over the years has been extremely dangerous. The health record of workers here in southern West Virginia over the years has been abysmal. There have been some major disasters, but the fact of the matter is there have been much more, more frequently an endless series of minor disasters. This is a very dangerous profession. And a lot of people have been hurt a lot of people have been scarred as they move into their retirement years by injury or illness like black lung, for example. <clears throat> Consequently, the state's health and welfare budgets, workers' comp budgets have been, have been challenged over the years. Insurance has been very expensive here because the work here is so dangerous. The fact of the matter is, as long as coal was predominant, all of the other things associated with personal development, educational levels, and all the rest of it remained secondary. Now with coal, experiencing probably the greatest decline it's ever experienced. Many people are beginning to look for alternatives, ways to diversify the economy. People now are beginning to look at what we have to deal with. We have an uneducated or undereducated population. There's one county in the coal fields here where two of every three people who work for a living do not hold even a high school diploma. Education here has not been a priority. It's been a mandate, a legal mandate that many young people pursued grudgingly. And now for so many people to begin, you know, to be saying from a number of different directions that West Virginia's future is in the education of its people, it's hard to appreciate how revolutionary, how unprecedented for this region that message is. We don't know how to do it. Myself and two colleagues in our meetings over the last several weeks and months have come up with a plan that we think can work. And in our second hour, we've just gone beyond the top of our first hour in today's program. I'd like to share our program, our proposal with you in the second hour. If there's ever a program in which I solicited more input than I have a right to, it's, this, it's gonna be this one. I treasure your response, your ideas, your suggestions, because I think in my professional career, which has spanned a number of years, a number of decades, I believe that at least potentially this might be the important, most important thing I've ever done. And 
I want to give it a chance. And part of giving it a realistic chance is to share it with you and throw out these ideas to you in full recognition that your response and your reactions are critical to how well this particular proposal works. With that then, I'd like to pause and take a five minute break. We're at five minutes after the hour. Um, that'll leave 50 minutes, uh, the better part of a full hour. And I'd like to use that hour to share some of the ideas and some of the proposal that I have with you. You are listening to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. We're gonna pause for a five minute break and then we'll be right back. I hope you'll stay with us. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes, and welcome to our second hour here in this Monday edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. It is the first day of February. Welcome to a new week. Welcome to a new month. And if you are just joining us, welcome to this, our second hour of our program today in the Virtual Center. As I mentioned just prior to the break, this particular hour is one that I, I look forward to with with some trepidation because I, I really want some of the things that we'll be including in this hour to, to be things that folks listening can chew upon and think about because I really do believe in my years of experience that these are the kinds of things that we can make work. Uh, I do invite your participation in the program. We have a phone number. Uh, I would look. I would w relish uh, your willingness to pick up the phone and join us in in some of the conversation and discussion about some of these issues. Our phone number is area code 304-663-4676. 304-663-4676. If you'd like to communicate with me one on one via email, my email address is w a o'brien906 at gmail.com w-a-o'brien o-b-r-i-e-n 906 at gmail.com and I do invite you to visit our Facebook page and to react to some of the postings that are there uh, we welcome your input welcome your suggestions and your comments I think whether you whether you comment on the page as Facebook uh, gives us the opportunity to do or whether you sit down and email me on a particular posting or whether you in fact call in. In tomorrow's program or the next day's program uh, in order to discuss the particular issue that caught your attention, that caught your fancy, uh, we would love to hear from you. So if you are a Facebook user, just type in the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and you will have access to our Facebook page. In our first hour, we were leading into the second one. Um, I tried to sketch out uh, some of the background, some of the, uh, uh, I tried to clarify as best I can, some of the need, educational need that we are seeing here in West Virginia. But the fact of the matter is we've done enough over the months with economic change, with the emergence of the so-called new capitalism to appreciate the fact that the world of work is changing, not just here in West Virginia, but everywhere. And more and more, the accountability numbers are beginning to show that in area after area, we're having difficulty competing and staying up with the world at large. A good friend of mine, in fact, one of the three colleagues that I've been talking about, uh, who's responsible for this particular proposal I'm going to introduce in a moment. He made the, pom uh, he made the, the comment uh, the other one day last week that he has a good friend that he worked with in the private sector. In fact, it was uh, for a number of years, he was in human resource management with Westinghouse Corporation. And he was talking about one of the people that he worked with at Westinghouse who he's remained very close with. And this particular person has, has gone into a new industry which is pretty high tech. 
Uh, it's, faced, it's, it's based principally on the search for engineering skills. And he asked his, his, asked his friend whether, in fact, his company is having trouble finding qualified engineers and people with the kinds of high-tech skills that they need in that particular field. And his response, surprisingly, was, not at all. We don't have any trouble finding our people at all. And my friend couldn't understand that and said, explain to me, what, how? He said, we go overseas. We don't even look in the United States anymore because we know that the talent we need is going to be outside the United States, not within it. That comment is devastating. That comment, it seems to me, reveals the depth of the challenges and the problems we have. And we can spend all of the efforts and spin all of the wheels we want to spin in the areas of math, engineering, and technology. But the fact of the matter is, before we get there, we've got to, we've got to qualify the bulk of our young people for the potential opportunities that those fields offer. We've got to educate everybody in order to find the talent that can handle and master those particular areas, those particular fields. We can't just continue to write off the bulk of our population and write off the education system that brings them to us. If our education system is not doing the job, then it seems to me we need to go back and fix it. And we need to remediate, and of course the, remedi the whole idea of remedial education, we need to remediate, we need to go back and re-educate those for whom education didn't take the first time. We've got to learn from what didn't work and make the kinds of changes necessary to make sure that it works this time. That, it seems to me, is the principal premise of this particular proposal. Let me share with you what we have in mind. We have formed an organization, a limited liability corporation called University College. We see University College as a consulting firm. We see University College not being a college that enrolls students as other colleges do. We see this one as being different. We see it affiliating, contra contracting with existing institutions. Because what education needs is going to take the kinds of classroom flexibility that existing colleges and universities and even K through 12 high schools and middle schools don't have. The only way that we can make this work, it seems to us, is to be able to change on the fly to be mobile, to be, to be flexible, to dictate our own levels of accountability. If we're going to allow other people to evaluate how well we're doing what we're doing, and if we have to prepare our students to do well on those accountability measures and tests, then that's going to deteriorate and draw away from what we're about. We need to base the, the areas uh, that, that measure our accountability on what we're doing. In other words, we have to define how we want to be held accountable because what we're doing is not happening anywhere else. We can't expect current institutions to do it because they have standards, they have alumni, they have obligations that they may, may have to meet. 
They have obligations with the state government. They have ob obligations with the federal government. They have obligations with accrediting agencies. Their programs are accredited but in particular by pr particular professions. And they have obligations to meet there. Their law schools, for example, are accountable to the legal profession. And consequently, the legal profession, by definition, controls what happens in the law school. We need to break free from that. We need to take what we mentioned an hour ago about charter schools and put it on steroids. We need to have the freedom and the flexibility to innovate. And we can't fail. With that, then, let me introduce you to University College. University College, LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, is a not-for-profit, limited liability, higher education and career skills firm. The people who founded University College, which is myself and two colleagues, command well over a century of combined experience at the undergraduate and graduate levels in both administration and teaching. And amongst the three of us, we have been affiliated with some of the premier institutions, not only in the nation, but in the world. Louisiana State University, the University of Wisconsin and Madison, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, the University of Toronto, Virginia Commonwealth University, West Virginia University, and of course, Concord University here in West Virginia. Included in the years of experience that the three of us bring to this project from those and in other institutions are decades of service at the off-campus director and vice president academic dean levels of administration. Over a quarter century of experience in accrediting institutions as an agent of the Higher Learning Commission. In other words, one of the three of us for 30 years has been traveling around the country representing the Higher Learning Commission, making accreditation decisions for colleges and universities throughout the nation. And as I mentioned earlier, one of our participants has 30 years of private sector experience in human resource management with Westinghouse Corporation. Result, University College, LLC, knows the skill demands of the 21st century and how best to prepare our citizens for them. Not just a few of our citizens, all of our citizens, who will be able to meet those demands. But not only that, these students will be able to anticipate the demands of tomorrow as well. We're going to educate people not in skills they need to fill jobs that exist now. We are going to educate people principally to be able to educate themselves as they move from career to career, from profession to profession, from one field to the other field. The skill demands are going to change. And the students we want to prepare will be able to anticipate those changes and make the necessary accommodations and skill upgrades necessary to meet them. The people we're talking about will not only be qualified to move into one particular job and then be rendered unemployed when that job phases out and is replaced by robots or something. We are going to educate people whose principal skill is the ability to educate themselves and re-educate themselves. In other words, 
we are going to put substance into the phrase lifelong learning. For years, people have been talking about lifelong learning. To most people, it has no meaning. To us, it means everything. Because that's ultimately what our mission is about. UC, which we call it affectionately University College, UC employs educational strategies that focus on learning how to learn, on student academic as well as attitudinal development, rather than the skill specifics of jobs that frequently change before we can educate people to fill them. How many times have we seen community colleges especially caught up in this? Somebody enrolls at a community college and uh, enrolls in a program, a diploma program or a certificate program to become specialized enough to get jobs in a particular area. And by the time they graduate and are ready to go to work, there aren't any jobs in those areas. The field is disappearing because it's been replaced by something else. We need to educate people who can handle the something else, if that makes sense. University College addresses, and this is under the heading of mission, University College is geared to handle head-on what is perhaps the most exasperating aspect of successful partnerships between higher education and communities, any community. How to find ways to reach and deliver meaningful services to under and uneducated adults that higher education does not and currently cannot serve. We know, no matter where we live, that there's a whole element of the population out there that not only is not currently contributing to the community they live in, we're talking about a population that shows no hope of ever contributing to communities they live in. These are people that we have written off as people who will be forever on the take, who will be forever the recipient of checks. How many people in our communities do we know that are receiving some sort of funding because of their disability? How often do we think about the fact that because you are disabled in one area, that doesn't mean that you are disabled in every other area. That doesn't mean because you can't do the particular job you were trained to do, that you can't ever work again. On the contrary, we need to reach those people. We need to find those people. We need to stimulate and motivate those people. And this is significant. We need to, let, uh, to allow those people to confront the reality that with taxes the way they are, with state budgets the way they are, with the international economy the way it is, the taxpayers are not going to be able to give them a check forever. State after state is moving in the direction of requiring some sort of work, some sort of community effort, requiring something in return for the assistance they provide. This is not a short-term phenomenon Clearly, this is something that state after state 
is beginning to take seriously. Here in West Virginia, our own state agency, the D Division of Health and Human Services, Health and Human Resources, on its website, now suggests that adults who are, for whatever reason, rendered unable to work, if they do not have young children at home, are required to put in a middle amount, a minimum amount of time every week doing something in return for the public assistance that they are receiving, whether it's food stamps, whether it's subsidized education, whether it's health care, whether it's rent, whether it's health insurance for their children. More and more, the taxpayers of this country are not going to take kindly to, to people who are perpetually on the take. And I don't want this to sound cruel. It's not cruel. Because the fact of the matter is, most of these people don't want to be there either. Most of these people would like to find productive opportunities that they too would feel good about, that they could be proud of, that would allow them to claim an element of dignity for what they are contributing to the quality of life in their own communities. We are aiming this program to meet those needs and fulfill those obligations. The fact of the matter is, the way higher education is currently structured, these under and uneducated adults that higher education is not serving and currently cannot serve, this situation will not change until this overlooked population is identified, evaluated, and rendered college ready or employment ready. That's what University College LLC is positioned to accomplish. We can do it in partnership with a higher education institution. We can do it in partnership with health and human resource departments within states. We can do it with corrections officers in people who are in jail, in prison, for nonviolent crimes. The fact of the matter is many of these people in prison sit there, they work out, they, work, they lift weights, that's all they do. This program offers an opportunity for these people to come out of these institutions with skills that enable them to take care of themselves and not be part of the recidivism numbers, the numbers of people who come out of correctional facilities and find themselves back in jail within a year or two. The only way that recidivism is going to diminish in this country is, is when we find ways to seriously address the work skills and educational skills of these folks. We propose to do it. We can do it in conjunction as part of a contractual relationship with existing agencies and institutions. But we can't let those agencies and institutions run the program. Because the drumbeat that they march to, the accountability measures that they face, dictates how they do what they do. And how they do what they do is not even reaching the population we're talking about. 
We have to be independent. We have to be flexible. We can affiliate. By contract, we can agree that our students will be accountable, that we will turn out students who pass the same tests that theirs do. We are proposing to educate people, adults, and if they choose to go the route of full-time higher education, they can pass the college boards, they can pass the ACT tests, they can pass and meet the same admission standards that any college student currently is required to meet. But in order to get them there, we have to have the flexibility to educate them in ways different from how our current institutions are educating them. If we do affiliate with an institution, and I will be very honest with you, we have sent this proposal to West Virginia University and it's moving its campus here to, to Southern West Virginia. And we have offered the contractual kind of relationship we're talking about. Because West Virginia University is coming into this region where there are dire academic and skill needs. But the fact of the matter is, under its current requirements and accountability standards, West Virginia University, like other institutions here, is going to have to compete with the best, most skilled elements of, the, of our population. That's going to leave the bulk of our population continued as unserved. That's the population we'd like an opportunity to serve. The fact of the matter is then, if we affiliate with, an, with a higher education institution, with a college or a university, that college or university will not be competing with other colleges and universities because the fact that we're there will mean that we are generating for them a stream of students that all colleges and universities will be able to enroll. In other words, we are offering a service that is not competitive, but rather enables institutions to cooperate with, with each other because we will be providing a steady stream of qualified, motivated, well-prepared students that currently nobody is serving, nobody is even looking to enroll. One other factor, we believe that the segment of the population that we're targeting is a prince in most communities, not just ours, in most communities is a principal user of taxpayer resources. These are the people that are receiving assistance. These are the people that are receiving subsidized health care. These are the people that are receiving educational stipends for retraining because the jobs they're in don't exist anymore. These are the people that are qualifying for food assist assistance, for rent subsidies. All of the other techniques and strategies that society has come up with in order to supplement and subsidize the income of those who are currently unable to generate enough income to take care of themselves. When you add all of that up, it is our conclusion that the segment of people that we're talking about serving is the very segment that uses up the bulk of taxpayer resources, at least in flex flexible revenue. These are the people that state but that a, the, the, whose delivery of services is breaking state budgets. 
Consequently, then, what we're arguing, what we're saying is that by targeting our services to this group of people and potentially making them financially independent of the state, of the taxpayers, then this is going to contribute meaningfully to regional economic development. It's going to reduce the amount of taxpayer money that must go to take care of these people. Obviously, there are certain people in society, we all know that, who must be taken care of, who will not never be able, for one reason or another, to become totally independent. Nobody questions, nobody disputes delivering, uh, delivering help to these folks. These are the folks that genuinely did, did need it. But when you remove the others, when you remove the others that have fudged the rules a little bit in order to get on disability, when you convert them into independent entities, then the portion of state budgets that goes for public assistance are reduced. State budgets are made healthier. We believe that that translates directly into economic development. Even more than that, if we are able to turn this segment of the population around educationally, then we are able down the road to aim at having the kind of high quality, high tech skilled workforce that will indeed attract jobs, not employers who, are, who want to come in and exploit cheap labor, rather employers who want to come in and enter the 21st century world of high technology because they will have access to a, to a workforce with the skills to handle it. That's, in a nutshell, the program. So in summary, who are these students? Who are these uneducated and uneducated adults? Currently, they are adults who are unprepared for regular college classwork. For them, they, maybe they quit high school. Maybe they passed high school, but you know, in a lot of cases, what that means. Many of them can't read. Whatever it is, they are unprepared for, for college-level work that is meaningful. These are the ones who currently go to college, qualify for maximum amounts of federal financial aid, and then end up in programs that are the least challenging. The college majors that don't require math classes, for example. The programs that allow people to get credit for work experience, whatever that experience might be. In other words, we've gone into the business in this country of credentialing people who really haven't earned the credentials they hold. We have too many people who are walking around with high school diplomas and college degrees and certificates that can't do anything. So the fact of the matter is, there's a whole population there that has the ability and the skills and we believe the motivation <coughs> to want to do something meaningful. We believe that we can make that happen. So these are people that currently are unprepared or underprepared for college work. Some of them are what we call stopouts. For those of you who are not into the higher education jargon, and I can understand that because there's only a few people who are, what higher education people refer to as stopouts are those people that do a little bit of college and then they leave. They drop out. 
Some of them drop out because they got a job. Some of them drop out because they're having kids. They're in families with kids and they have to get jobs. Some drop out because they went through a divorce or they lost their job. But the fact of the matter is they have some college, but not enough to qualify them for any for anything unless they come back. These are what we call stopouts. Many of the adults we're talking about are stopouts. These are people that began college that but for one reason or another never completed it. Most of the people we're talking about are working family care adults who are supporting families who at this point if they're working can't even imagine taking substantive college coursework because they already believe that they're stretched, their schedules are too stretched. These are people that may have thought every once in a while, oh, it'd be great to go to college and get a degree. I'd like to do such and such. I'd like to, to give this a try. But I've got family responsibilities now and I can't quit my job and there's no way in the world I can fit a college program into the schedule that I'm currently running. So therefore, they've just abandoned the idea of doing anything to help themselves. Many of the people we're talking about are unskilled, totally unskilled. These are people that need intensive, top to bottom workplace training. I'm not talking about skills with computers. I'm talking about the kind of skills necessary to know how to take an interview, how to dress for an interview, how to groom for an interview, how to make a good impression, how to speak in an interview situation, how to put together a resume, how to make a good first impression. I think all of us can relate to the fact because all of us have seen situations where people come in looking for a job and they look like they just got out of bed. Their, their applications are in the circular file before the door closes. Here in West Virginia, and I guess this is true in many other places, we have the problem of drug abuse, prescription drug abuse, heroin, a lot, a lot of this. Employers who have moved into this region have told me that they are recruiting twice, sometimes three times the number of employees they'll ultimately need because they know that two out of every three people who respond to their job advertisement will not be able to pass a drug test. I'm going back to our friend Wayne here. We've talked about this many times. Wayne believes, as do I, that if you make it up, if you make good, high quality, good paying jobs available to people, you'll be surprised how many of these problems of drugs and unemployment and all the rest of it, abuse, child abuse and all the rest of it, will just kind of disappear because a lot of the drug use and abuse is driven by frustration and desperation and hopelessness. You make good high paying jobs available and we'll see how quickly the drug problem turns around. Wayne believes that, I believe that. So many of these people need training, they have no skills at all. Others are displaced workers who've lost their jobs, jobs that aren't coming back. We're seeing that here in, in the coal fields. Many of these people that worked in the mines whose, parent, whose dads and grandparents have worked in the mines, there's not gonna be any jobs in the mines anymore. These people are looking at major career change. They're in the, they've got major decisions facing them. These are the people we want to reach. 
financially challenged individuals, individuals who believe that college is only for the rich people, people who believe that in their financial situation, they can't even afford to think that college might be an option. We want to find those people. And finally, we want to talk to those people who never even considered college for themselves ever. Maybe, they're finan maybe it's financially challenged, folks. Maybe it's other reasons. Maybe nobody in their family ever went to college. Maybe college is not even in their conversation. It's not even in the vocabulary. It's not anything that they or the people they associate with ever talk about. When you put all of these different people together, we believe there's a significant potential college population there. We think that with the kinds of proper training and skill development, we believe that these people could become quality competitive students in our colleges and universities. We don't think it's necessary that our institutions of higher education go all the way around the world to find qualified students because we think we've got a formula to create our own. We can literally create our own college population. That's the straight, steady stream of qualified students that we were talking about. What I've said in this proposal is that there's no miracle formula here. We're not talking about any kind of a magic bullet to turn economies and people's lives around. What university college offers is the kind of flexibility, dedication to quality education, dedication to the region, and most importantly to the students that we would serve. We know what needs to be done and we know how to do it. That's not arrogance. It's the result of generations, decades of experience in the classrooms and in administrative positions in higher education. We know what works. We know why some of the things we're doing now don't work. And with the kinds of flexibility that we're looking for in a contractual relationship, we believe that we can turn economies around because we can take the largest segment of the population that is using resources and we can convert that segment of the population into the contributor of resources. Our, our target is small. We're looking to begin with something in the area of 100 students. We will develop and we are designing very specific courses the so-called general education portion of a college curriculum. For those of you who are familiar with college or university work, you know that no matter what you major in, everybody has a requirement that they must take certain general education or general studies classes. Everybody must take English 101 and 102, for example. Everybody must take a course in composition writing. Everybody must take a course in literature. Everybody must take a course in history of some kind. Every, most people, everybody usually takes a class in public speaking. Everybody takes courses in the arts. Everybody takes courses in the social sciences, whether it's geography, whether it's government, whether it's economics, whatever. These are our general education requirements. We know, most of us know, that these tend to be little more than smorgasbords, kind of a Chinese menu where you need two of these, three of these, one of those, and you're done. For evidence of that, just think of the number of students that you've talked to 
who are very early in their college careers who will tell you when asked, I've got my general studies out of the way. I've got my English out of the way. I've got my history out of the way. I got my math requirement out of the way. I met my, my science requirement. In other words, I've done all the stuff that, that basically I had to take that didn't, that, where I didn't learn anything. Now I'm ready for my major. Now I'm ready to study something that I really want to take. What we're saying is we're going to redesign general education. We're going to put together a five course curriculum that everybody takes. And it's going to be the toughest damn curriculum that anybody ever saw. We've been talking on this program for a long time about core standards, the common core. The idea that there are certain pieces of knowledge that everybody has to have in order to consider themselves educated. We're going to put together courses comprised of that knowledge. Not only that, but we're going to build the skills, the reading skills, the critical reading skills, the ability to write, the ability to do research, the ability to speak, the ability to put together reports and to sell a point of view. All those things that are necessary in order to reach success in today's more competitive global economic situation. That's kind of what we're talking about. I think we're kind of moving towards the end of our program here and I don't wanna, I don't wanna just suddenly run out of time and stop. We're at 56 minutes after the hour. So we've got a couple of minutes to wrap up here. I haven't gone into any specifics. I'd like to take a moment, a portion of tomorrow's program and share a number of those specifics with you because I think the situation seems to call for them. So far, this is all theory. This is all abstract. It's all a series of promises. There's no substance to it. The question that's probably in your mind is, what do you propose to do that's different from what people are doing now, and why will it work? That's what I'd like to deal with tomorrow, at least for a portion of tomorrow's program. I want to get back into the nature of America's two-party system, but I really believe that this particular topic can't be allowed to go on unaddressed any longer. So I really want to take the opportunity to deal with it while it's here and while we're into it. There were a couple, there's a friend of mine that, that I used to teach with and he had a strategy that I thought was wonderful. At the end of every class that he taught, he, about three or four minutes before the end, he would say, okay, what have we learned today? Chris Matthews, if you watch him on MSNBC, does the same thing. The last portion of his program each night is, what can you tell me that I didn't know? Or what have, what have, what have we learned today? Well, it seems to me what I hope we've learned is that the current way that we evaluate our students is woefully deficient. We are basically assigning our young people to less than challenging roles in our society. As the competitive demands for skills increases, the ability of our young people to meet those standards seems to be declining. The result is we've got a lot of people out there that we would call adults that are in the Never Never Land. They don't know which way to turn. They don't know how to go, how to proceed. We think we've got a way. We think we've got some answers. Please take the time to think about some of this stuff. And if you, 
If you have something concrete or substantive that you'd like to share, I would love to hear from you, whether it's in an email, whether it's a phone call in tomorrow's program, whatever. We're at 59 minutes after the hour. It's time to sign off. I want everybody to have a wonderful evening. I want to thank you for being here once again for the Virtual Center. Tomorrow, I remind you, is Tuesday. Our program will begin one half hour later than it does today. Our program tomorrow will be 90 minutes rather than the full 120 minutes. This is Bill O'Brien. Thank you for supporting the Hit On Radio Network. Thank you for supporting the Virtual Center. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Be good to each other. And we'll look forward to seeing you again, hopefully tomorrow. Thank you.